Ciao. All right. Hey, Chow. I had to go get my headphones. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm out here doing what I can. Listen, that's all we can do right right now. Listen, we have been doing an interview series for the Woman Evolve podcast because it's technically off season, but there are too many things going on in the world to... Listen. There are too many things going on. In too the many world. things going on. There could not be more things going on in the world today. There's too many things. I thought that the too world. Many things. There are way too many. I thought the world was doing all that it could with coronavirus. Oh, but no, we have to be reminded no. of the underlying pandemic that lives in this country f- for centuries. I, but you see it. You seen it happen like every election year. I can't agree with Candace on that. Like every with year, Candace, Black Lives Matter. About? Every election, you uh, Black ooh. Lives Matter. Did you just say you agree with Candace Owens? In that instance, not in anything else. <laughs> Black Lives Matter all of the time, and I think that there's just a case that springs up that really changes everything, and this is one of those cases. I mean. George Floyd. Well, when I, because I was looking at, you know, just pictures of the last elections and everybody was talking about how big, you know, these protests and stuff has been. But I think it's it's not from like a, a statewide type thing, but that it has gotten global traction, yeah. international traction, the protesting. But Mar- uh, not Martin Luther King, Obama and Michelle were marching yeah. in the streets. You know, and so we've had these protests and we keep protesting. And I I think that it's a wonderful idea, but I think we can't stop until we really see. Yeah, keeping the momentum going. And I think it's going to be on the people who are starting the marches. Like I'm having a talk with uh, Christine Kane on today at six o'clock. So by the time this podcast airs, It'll be Wednesday and we're having a conversation at first, you know, it was kind of like, should I do it? Should I not do it? Is it getting too far out? But the thing is, the re- the only way we can keep this in people's presence and in their conscience is if we continue to keep expand the conversation for sure. Yeah. How has yeah, this season been for you? Um, it's been eventful. <laughs> it's been eventful. I guess I was reading a post the other day that said, if you wonder what you would have been doing during the civil rights and, and the protests in history, you're doing it now. And I've just been really trying to focus on teaching my children because I realized that embedded teaching can't be changed via protest. So I just had to teach my kids not to be racist. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to teach my kids what that looks like. And so yesterday I showed Tuga the little Sesame Street video mm-hmm. of Elmo um, and, and let him see that. And and just, you know, being really nervous about that conversation. You've got older boys, so I know that it's more difficult because you've got driving boys, you know. Tuga is sick, so it's not like uh, scary yet for us. But I can imagine, you know, mothers of teenage sons, mothers of adult sons, that this is like a nightmare and we've got to figure something out. Dr. Anita has been talking about racism from a cultural worldview perspective, which has really Mm -hmm. been helpful for me because it is just helping me to see how large the divide is between what it means to be black in America and what it means to be white in America. So I have a lot more understanding, I think, about like how maybe white people who have now become allies in this recent event, how they could have been so blind to it all the way, you know, all along. I think that what made George Floyd's case so devastating is like, even though we were protesting when people got shot, 
you know, guns are split second decisions, you know, and yes. people feel like, oh my, you know, he's under pressure, this is happening, and he just pulled and shot. But for the officer to be there for eight minutes long and to like not even readjust his knee or look down or like nothing and to the point that he dies, I think that is when it became cruelty to not just us, because we've been saying that there are some serious issues with the black re community and policing. But I think mm -hmm. for people who maybe would not have been moved otherwise, I do feel like from a white leadership perspective, from a corporate perspective, that we've really had more conversation about race and about the systemic issues that exist within this country. Like what happened with George Floyd was a combination of what it means to be black in America. Like if there is a white guy pinned underneath a white officer knee and there are white people surrounding him telling him to move he can't breathe like does he move likely you know what I mean yeah because there's just a level of respect and a little bit more humanity and empathy when you're talking and dealing with someone who looks like you but because we have this great divide I think it's become even more challenging but Dr. Anita is helping me as I because what I've been doing is like I've been hosting these like safe space conversations for white leaders who want to come and want to ask questions without sounding racist so that when they do yes. speak out they don't say things that are ignorant or offensive to black people of course I don't speak on behalf of all black people but I can tell you what you don't want to say right now and these are people who were probably like all lives matter type of people who are now really seeing that like whoa we really don't have an, a thought process that makes it feel like black lives matter in this country and I want to be a part of that change but they don't know where to start so it's been it's been mentally and emotionally exhausting. Like I told PT, I am tired. <laughs> and I was like, I don't even know no, why no. I'm tired. And, um, you know, I think it just costs more to show up, to be strong, to to own your blackness, like in seasons like this and to live amidst the pandemic and walking your children through it. But I tell you, you know, we live in a predominantly white neighborhood. And when we yeah. turned the corner the other day and saw white people out protesting, like I literally started crying because I was like, we matter to them because so often it feels like our blackness is ignored or yeah. tolerated for sure De dealt with that's that's why i'm trying to figure out who the allies are that we have that are not you know black or not brown versus those who have just been dealing with us yeah you know and so there's that there's that mindset of just you know we deal with black people we don't like or dislike it's just something that we deal with. And so trying to find, because I've had, I have maybe got one hand of white friends um, and just watching their them not post or, or post um, has changed kind of my view sure. of, of them. Um, if you're silent, it is. It is a, a compliance. It's an, a, an agreement to, to what's going on. When you respond, all lives matter to black lives matter, it's that black lives are not included in the all. Yeah. So even in, even in that division where we're having, it's like uh, that comedian said, like we can't agree on anything. We can't just agree that we matter. Right. You know, like that's a problem. It's a problem for us to say that we matter. But we pay taxes like y'all. We we pay rent and mortgage like y'all. We we go to school and and get education like you all. But we're not treated in this government as as equal. And I think, like you said, we're just tired. Like George Floyd was just like the last straw. Like you are not going to make us watch you kill somebody right. for eight minutes. It was like watching someone hang from a tree for sure yeah modern it, day it, lynchings it's, it's a modern day lynching eight minutes and then i and then i thought at what point do we get to intervene yeah well that's the you thing know, like, like when, 
Uh, Dr. Anita and I were actually talking about that and she was saying like part of what made that George Floyd case so devastating is that we also knew even the people standing by had they intervened would have been shot dead and a lot of people are like okay so the cop was wrong but why are we calling it racist and I want to explain that to some of my white listeners who might be listening right now the reason why this has come down to racism in the George Floyd case is because it is incomprehensible that this same scenario would have happened to a white man and that there would have been any delay in pressing charges, that the people standing by wouldn't have intervened and said, absolutely not get off of him without fear of losing their life in the process of doing that. Like all of those systems played a part and what took place in that moment. And I can um, remember some people are like, you know, we're making, I've seen like all types of thoughts, of course, on social media and people are talking about, you know, well, he went to jail for cocaine and he had this past and he had this history. Yeah. That does that mean he's and part of the reason, like if you want to talk about like cocaine sentences and the inequity when it comes to the criminal justice systems for black people who receive sentences or larger sentences conversely to their white counterparts. And that's a whole nother conversation, like his entire life is a result of the systemic oppression that we're talking about does he end up in those situations if he has opportunities if he is educated on the same level of his white counterparts if there is some type of some type of opportunity for restitution we're not asking you I, I love that video <laughs> that we have in our family group yeah, message it is my favorite. where sis it's talks my favorite. about it like monopoly and she's not lying <laughs> she's not she's lying not. It's true. And I think that what she says in that moment is so true. And black people are tired but I have never black people are tired of it and white people are just now getting upset by it and I think that dichotomy of black people being tired and white people being angry has created for me at least I feel an opportunity for me to take a minute and to really assess the trauma of being black you know what I mean like because I I keep hearing this analogy of like all lives matter but if the black if the if there's a house on fire in your community and everyone's Mm -hmm like help the house is on fire and someone's like all houses matter then of course that wouldn't make sense because right now this house is on fire the black community is on fire but imagine being the black community with the house on fire and only people who look like you are fighting that battle and then people start coming out of their house and they start shooting at shooting their water getting their extinguishers to take the fire out like that means something it it is not just a social media post to let us know like hey i'm with you i'm trying to fight this thing with you it really does matter but part of that okay. having allies come in helping to fight combat fight and combat this battle also means that black people have an opportunity to take a minute because we've been fighting this for all of our lives and our all of our grandparents lives and all of our great grandparents lives to say wow this really is traumatic there is a validation and i'm not saying that we need validation for what we've been saying but there is there is a, a something that we received I, 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 I believe we need validation for what we've been saying. <laughs> yeah, I think there's I, something I to white people fair, finally it seeing it. This long. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's fair that it took them this long to see it, to see that black people have been fighting for opportunity. Um, it, it like like I said, going back to that video, it's like we haven't been given a leg up. We yeah. we haven't been gi- when we did get a leg up. Y'all got mad and you burn everything down and you fought our best because you didn't want us to get a leg up. And so I think that like I was reading a post the other day and it said if we only do this with black people, then we will become black supremacists. Oh, uh, that was this change. That was Terry was Cruz. That? Terry Cruz just said that. That's who yes, he was going to yes. try and rescue today. He Hold on. I want to read it exactly how he said it for those who maybe didn't get a he- chance to hear it. But Terry okay. Crews tweeted, defeating white supremacy without white people creates black supremacy. Equality is the truth. You, you, no, no. Then listen. No. What I believe he is saying, or how I interpreted it rather, was that we can't, it's just like you said, we can't do this movement without white allies. We're we're not going to be able to make the change that's necessary if we don't have white people standing with us. 
No, yeah, no. I think that there's beauty in allyship because I think white people talk to white people. And when white people are talking to white people about matters that are important to black people, there is an opportunity for change. But there will not be black supremacy in America. The systems have been that have been set in place in this country for hundreds of years. Like we we can't That's have not ever gonna it's happen never going to happen. Supremacy. Like we can have equality, but anymore. black supremacy. And we're not right. even asking for black supremacy. We're just asking to have some equality around here we're not saying that we want to feel like we're better than anybody or we want white people to suffer the way that we suffered and we want them in chains for 400 years we don't want any of that we just want to feel like people care about our life no matter what our criminal record may be and we can talk about how we ended up in those criminal situations which is another evidence of black uh the black systemic injustices in this country but we're not we're not even getting into all of those things what we're just saying is that we want black lives to matter and so this notion that there could be anything like black supremacy I strongly no, I strongly disagree you're trying to rescue yeah, him you're right um when you when you Poor. put it that way I guess there was a hope within me that we could get to that kind of power no know, we're, um, well uh, what kind of power is that the the kind of power where we become the majority and not the minority of of power in this country. Really? I, so you, I like the idea. What? The idea, I like the idea <laughs> of us gaining power back. I think that from, we have been so power deficient in that the idea of it may sound because everybody saw a uh, black Panther. So you trying to do something that we, we, we not going to be able to do that the way that you didn't see that in the movie. We just saying that what we want, I like the idea of Wakanda. but what like I'm saying is that if you get to a place where you feel equal, we have been so power deficient that if we would at least begin to feel equal and that our children have some advantages in our education system and in the communities they live in, I think that we would be, I think that's adequate. Like I think equality is yeah. adequate. I think to ask for supremacy. I don't think it's, I'm, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's unfair to ask for equality. Like I, I, I feel like we are too. It's twenty twenty. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like we are, we are too far away to still be dealing with four hundred year old oppression. It's twenty twenty. Why isn't it fair for us to have equality? Why is it wrong for us to say Black Lives Matter? Why is it wrong for us to not want to die on the sidewalk? Why is it wrong for us to to want to breathe? I what, think the thing the is that like people that? feel like, well, the laws, there are no laws that are against you all, so you all are equal. But the thing is, the reason why we are not equal is because laws don't change hearts, they don't change minds, and so laws cannot even be enacted. Now, and that's even just the legal perspective. I think if we push that to the side, like to have you know, 300 years of a leg up on someone, you know, yeah, now we're equal by law, but we're also behind 300 years. Like we, we, you know, if you, equality would mean getting a little bit more help and resources so that we can catch up. That means maybe putting some funding into our schools and into our mental health and into aftercare programs and making sure, I know equal opportunity was like a big thing where people were like, you know, they're just taking advantage of equal opportunity or you're just hired because you're black. And maybe in some instances you are, not only are we black, but we're going to be qualified. We're not asking you to pass us anything. Like we'll work for it. But we'll earn it. But you can't just keep putting us down and then telling us, but you're equal. Martin Luther King right. Jr. That's talks what, about. That's what I'm saying. You can't you can't have it both ways. You can't say we don't matter, but we do. Yeah. Like it, 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 it doesn't work um, effectively. And when you have a president that won't say it. Mm. Won't say that black lives matter won't bring peace to the situation, won't say, hey, let's figure out what we can do to make this better, but is just kind of forcing the flame 
of of this hatred, it's it's even harder to try to change a government that is led by someone who will not say that we matter, who is telling the police officer, y'all need to take control. And they're tear gassing babies down the street as they drive down the street because that's how much we don't matter. And it's like, y'all want us to say, y'all want to tell us that we matter and that this isn't a real fight, but they're throwing tear gas cans at eight-year-old babies. I was going to ask black. you about that. What do you think about some of the kids being out at the protests? Well, okay, so I understand both sides. I understand wanting your children to be a part of history, wanting them to be in the pictures of history. I understand you wanting your children to see kind of what's going on in history and be in the movement of that. However, we're fighting against police brutality. And their response is more brutality. And if you are not the controlling leader of the protest, I don't think you should bring your children into something you're not controlling. Because anything can happen. These police are killing people, tear gassing people, beating people with bars. And we just saw that picture of the the police officer holding a gun to a little baby. baby girl. And so it, I, I, I get the sentiment of wanting your children, children to be a part of history, but let them watch it at home on top of the fact that there's this pandemic going on. And so that, too, is something you need to be protecting your children from. You need to, to be trying to protect them from. There's no reason why they can't watch the protests online. There's no reason why you can't communicate with your children what's going on. But I think five and under need to stay at home, maybe even eight and under, because it, it's, they're not, they don't care. You could be 75 years old, they knocking you out, and, and you could be an eight-year-old girl, they spraying you. you. It doesn't matter. You could be white, you could be black. If you're out there fighting. Anybody can get it. Right for black people, they are after you. They're 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 coming after you, and it saddens me because I wanted to be able to say, you know, this is just a Minneapolis problem. You know, like everybody wants to be like, it's just bad, you know, bad cops in Minneapolis, and then you hear Atlanta, and then you hear New York, and then you hear Texas, and it, you know, all of these states are like, no, the police crazy over here. They're, they're beating us over here. They're killing us over here. And so when you see a nationwide issue and you're not going to address it, that's a problem. This is a nationwide issue. I do think that the other officers being charged for not intervening does set a precedent when it comes to policing because it does mean that you can't just stand behind, I wasn't involved, I was just standing by, but because you didn't intervene and uphold the basic (gasps) rights that people deserve. But it's your job. Yeah. That's your job. It's your job to, to give aid to people who are hurting. It is your job to hold your coworkers in any job accountable to their position. And I, I think it's wonderful that they have been charged, but it would be even greater for them to be arrested, charged, and sentenced. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm nervous that, yes, they will be charged, and yes, they've been arrested, but will we get in front of a judge that's under this systemic racism that is going to sentence for white officers to prison? I think there's so much pressure. Like, I don't even want to go down the road of what would happen if there's no conviction, because if this is what we're getting. I'm telling you, I know for sure if they do not sentence those cops for prison, it ain't going to be good. This world is going to turn upside down. Yeah. Because that that is blatant. Like, (laughs) You're not. You're not gonna get around. You're, you're not, not even gonna, gonna make us believe you can. That. That, that is that is blatant murder. Yeah. Eight minutes and forty five seconds. We watched him kill him, and you're gonna tell us that it's not worth. We don't have enough evidence to sentence him. We don't have. 
he could have died of other causes. Like, are y'all serious? He's supposed to be appearing in court today, too. Even I do now. think, and I haven't seen it, but usually in these cases, I feel I like understand. the police um, associations come out and kind of speak on behalf of the officer. I haven't seen that in this case, which I think is an indication that even people in law enforcement are kind of like, no, this is not necessarily something that even we can say is okay. And, um, you know, they start GoFundMe pages and start bailing folks out, but I haven't seen that. Hopefully, it's because it doesn't exist and not just because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any officer say, you know, y'all don't understand what's going on. Yeah, you it's know, usually like the unions, they come out and they're like, you know, you, yeah, I haven't seen that. None of that. Most of the cops I've seen have been talking about how wrong it is. Yeah. Um, all of the things leading up to it. But even when you look at his record, it, again, they're looking for reasons that make it to okay. justify mm -hmm. him killing him on the sidewalk. And there is nothing that's not going work. to justify you killing this man. He could have been in the middle of a crack deal and there is still nothing that warrants your power being able to kill this man on the sidewalk because yeah. you saw his rap sheet. Yeah, like it's ridiculous. And it's a twenty dollar bill. We talking about a twenty dollar bill. It is ridiculous. A twenty dollar bill, yeah. sissy. He died from a twenty dollar bill. Yeah, it's not even that deep. Twenty dollars. and hollering and again I didn't watch the video but I've just been hearing you know step by step because I couldn't just, I couldn't bring myself to watch it just after hearing everybody explain the video to me I couldn't bring myself to watch it because I felt like that is that's such a helpless position to put everybody in Yeah, you know like those who were surrounding the situation I couldn't have been the person screaming, get off his neck. Like, I would have died out there trying to get the officer off his neck, you know? And it's not fair that we fear that. We fear saving people's lives yeah. because we could get killed or arrested as well. I figured that there were so many emotions just kind of going around in the world right now. And so I interrupted the interview series that we've been doing just so that we could kind of like talk and digest and maybe share some little stories. It's funny that you brought up Terry Crews because I was going to see if you wanted to try and rescue him, but I guess not. Um, yeah. It sounds like you don't want to rescue him. No, I don't. You're right. <laughs> you're right yeah and you're the one that has the mo more grace than me yeah see i'm operating in mercy today i I'm don't have it i don't today. have it to give i really don't <laughs> no mercy you have no mercy to give on today um let me see okay so i at least wanted to share some positive stories that i thought were really dope uh howard university alumni becomes the first black female officer in the u.s air force Thunder thunderbirds she took us a nice little photo but a howard university grad is making history becoming the first african-american woman officer in the u.s air force thunderbirds says nbc washington reports captain ramoshe nelson has served in the air force for the last eight years primarily overseas this is Nelson's first season with the Air Force Thunder Thunderbird Squadron, an elite group of flyers who have only 332 officers since its founding in 1953. She took a nice little picture of her in the Thunderbird, and it was really dope. So I wanted to acknowledge some excellence. Come on. Have you ever yeah, thought about... Let's just, let's just dominate. You wanted to go skydiving. Yes? I did. I did. Do you still want to go skydiving? Um, I want to be able to say that I did it to conquer that fear. But, you know, I just feel like so. Wait, I don't want to be afraid. So you want to go skydiving or no? I want to just to conquer the fear of it. But I also feel like I won't appreciate it until I'm almost close to the ground because my 
I just gonna be close. The so. whole time, I don't need to see nothing. Yeah, I don't really want to yeah, do it because I just don't feel like point. being afraid. How about that? Right, but see, that's what I'm saying. I want to conquer the fear, but I feel like I will be too afraid to appreciate the experience of conquering the fear because I'm going to keep my eyes closed. And they say the most beautiful part of skydiving is the view that you see as you are coming down, but I'm scared. Parasailing and skydiving is about like the same thing. Yeah, and you did a sale. I did, and and I I'm cool on it. Yeah, you hated it. There's an also a story about a Kenyan boy who is nine and receives awards for hand. He received an award for a hand washing machine invention. A nine year old Kenyan boy was given an award by the country's president for inventing a hand washing machine designed to prevent the spread of coronavirus because we are still in a pandemic. Stephen Wamukota. Mm. You better say the name right. I Mom, think I so. did too. I just said I decided to say it fast and see what happened, but it sounded right. Was among 68 people to receive the presidential order of service this week in recognition of service to Kenya amid the COVID 19 pandemic. How has the pandemic been shaping your life? Isn't a hand washing machine? Not in Kenya. Not in Kenya. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Not in this part of, not in this area of Kenya. To be able, okay, so the boy's invention is operated with a foot pedal that causes water and soap to be dispensed, saving users from having to touch any pieces of the machine that could be contaminated by the virus. The Bungoma County youth said he was inspired by watching people struggle to wash their hands without having to touch objects that were previously touched by unwashed hands. That, but you know what? That is what they do in hospitals. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's a foot pedal. So, way to go. Can you? Uh, the pandemic, I'm over it. I really am. What do you mean by that? Yes. <laughs> I'm just over it. I'm over it. I'm over being in the house. I'm over not being able to go to church. But, I am but, over but Dallas it. has reopened, Core. You can go out. You don't have to stay inside no more. You can go no, out. No, no. But, but you know that our governor has not released us. Your governor to go has? Out. Yes. He, no, no, sir. Sir Governor Thomas Jakes has not oh, released Oh, our anybody. governor. <laughs> yes, our governor has a still on lockdown would, i'm over it would I'm you but would you it. are you willing to take a chance like are you ready to go out listen i feel like if we are out here protesting but you need to wait here on the street nah anyway. but you need to wait two weeks to see what happens after these protests because you don't know because it takes two weeks to show up in two weeks yes check me check me back in two weeks um I don't think I'm ready to go back to church yet. Like maybe not like big events, crowded events, but Brandon went to protest the other day. Mm -hmm. But um, I I don't think I'm ready to do that. I'm just tired of being in this house. Where do you want to go? But like like, when I get tired of being in the house, I'd be thinking to myself, okay, like where do you want to go? Where do you want to go that would make you feel better? And then when I think about where I want to go, I'm like, I don't want to go. Like I don't want to go to the movies. I don't want to go sit at a restaurant. Like I'm tired of being in the house. But when it's time for me to actually think about all of, those, all of those are things I want to do. I want to go to the movie, but I'm not going to the movie. Exactly. I want to go to a restaurant, <laughs> but I'm not going to a restaurant. But that's what I'm saying. I'm tired of the oppression from the pandemic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I feel oppressed by the pandemic. And uh, it's, it's not going well. I do. I want to. It's summer. I want to go swimming. I want to take my kids to the pool. I want to take my kids to amusement parks and, and, you know, do summer fun stuff. And this is just, listen, if the numbers don't skyrocket in two weeks, I'm going to be very upset. I'm just, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to be very mad. I saw a report though that they're steadily rising. Steadily rising. But they was already steadily rising before the protest. <laughs> I don't need it to steadily rise. I needed to fight after <laughs> these protests. 
so that I can be ensured that my being at home is not for not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> of course. Because if y'all have 3,000 people out here on the street protesting in masks and some not, and these numbers don't fight, with it. I'm gonna have an issue with it. I'm going to kind of think this is a scam demic. Oh, it, it, poor it a scam demic. I cannot. I it is so. not a scam demic. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. Court, you are so ignorant. <laughs> I'm not sure about it. Court. I'm needing to see spikes. I'm needing to see spikes in two weeks. Two weeks back. In New York, things were absolutely crazy. I assure you, it's not a scamdemic. It better spike, is all I'm saying. <laughs> back to because what you we said. We are out here. We are out here with no mask and no glove, acting like Corona is not present. Corona be gone. Now. And the media, the media has done it as well. Corona be gone yeah. has happened. Okay. We're not, you're not hearing it anymore. It's not trending like it was. Like, that's because right now we're talking about, that's because we got other things to talk about. We protesting and tearing. It's another, to- it's another topic, right? But Corona killing people, millions of people, we supposed to die. Millions of people supposed to die, but we're not covering that no more because a more important story yes. has come up is what y'all are saying. Right. So a more important story has come up than Corona that's supposed to kill 25% of America. Court, okay, I'm going to ask you another question. When is the last time you actually oh. watched the news? <laughs> I listen every morning. I pick a, I pick somebody I'm going to watch. Who you watch? I do about an hour. I, it's either going to be Trevor Noah because he keep me engaged and entertained. Uh, Angela Rye, I, I do. Court. I do rock with Angie because she Court. she be about that line. Court. But those are not uh, news oh, outlets. Oh, and Cuomo, Cuomo, and that Cuomo, Cuomo, Cuomo Angie Cuomo. <laughs> Cuomo. he comes on at night. Chris Cuomo, Cuomo on CNN. Core, you do not Chris watch Cuomo. the news. Yes. you don't even watch the news. I, it could I be spiking, and you would never know. Core, you don't watch the news. Well, you can't talk about how the news is not covering what's happening in the world if you're only getting your news They're on Instagram so. TV. Not, because, <laughs> you know, but, 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 you know, but, you know, I know they're not because you said it and you watch the news. Okay, right. Moving on. I do watch the news. They cover it. It's just not right. to the extent that they're covering the protests right now. And I told you that's where right. I got my steadily rising. It's something more important. It's something more important than Corona. That's what they saying. That's what the media is saying. Corona <laughs> ain't more important than these protests. And so y'all told us to stay in the house. Don't be out. Stay at home. But people can protest down the street, thousands of people, and ain't nobody said we're worried about Corona during this Cor, time. They do, Cor, they, Cor, of that has Walk actually been sidewalk. said. That has actually been when, said. When, who, who said it, and, and do they do it daily? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> I'll be watching CNN and stuff, but I do know that a corona isn't being covered like it used to be. That's true. That- it's not trend it's not trending like it used to be. And people ain't scared like they were. And so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like what is it like is racism worth dying for and corona is not? Yes. That's what I'm saying. I'm, for the people so who are out there the, protesting, they have the taken into account coronavirus and they're like, in order for us to end this, then this is worth the potential exposure to this disease. And coronavirus getting diagnosed is not necessarily a death sentence. I think if you have underlying right. health issues, you should probably you know, consider protesting from home or other ways of engaging in the movement, which are just as valuable. Even if you're not on the front lines, it doesn't mean that you can't help create conversations, donate, post on social media, inform, educate, etc. But for those who are on the front line, I think they're taking a calculated risk. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. In that case, then you need to put that decision back in our hands. Mm -hmm. Because you all told us 
to stay at home because it was too dangerous. But we have enough power within ourselves to make a decision to take that risk. And so if people want to take that risk, give them the, well, the opportunity to do so. To be fair, your government has allowed you to take that risk. You're scared of your father. Well, it's phase two. We're not in phase three yet over here. Are your restaurants open? Uh, yes, but only 10 or 15 percent of occupancy. Yeah, our restaurant. restaurants are open. I was surprised people are out there eating. 25. Too. Yes, yeah, yeah, I saw a lot of people going to the restaurants and stuff. And I get it, but I just, I don't think I'm the kind of person to be like 10 feet away from the table, putting a mask on when your waitress comes, taking the mask off to eat your food. No, <laughs> I would just pick my food up and, eat and it at the house. take it to the house. Yeah. Okay, I want to do some advice questions. Okay. okay this one says hopefully this is not all over the place but i just need a release and advice i've been married for six years we have a daughter together and i gained a son things were pretty good in the beginning but our marriage was overthrown by his social activities and family although we have had conversations as well as went to counseling about our issues i do not see the growth in our marriage just a short summary of what i feel like our issues are is that his twin brother 36 and mother-in-law live with us for free our bills continue to grow because of the extra bodies but but no contribution on their end because they are currently not working and typically do not hold a job beyond three to six months i feel as though i'm left with this slack of providing for them too they have lived with us the past five years contributing nothing to core stop shaking your head they have lived with us for the past five years they've been married six years they've been living with me for the last five years contributing nothing to bare minimum i'm physically mm -hmm. and emotionally exhausted i have a pretty good relationship with my mother-in-law and at times want to express my feelings of being overwhelmed but feel like that's a broken battle which would make my living situation that much more difficult my husband has a job and actually does pretty well for himself but his money is spent on luxury while i continue to time in and time out to make sure that the house is good um I want out yeah. I've asked my husband when their expiration date is for us having our home to ourselves and his mother and brother to be gone and there's not one I'm the only one who's uncomfortable in this situation this is not what I expected marriage to look or feel like I recently gave my life back to Christ but I'm so angry and hurt I've prayed and asked God for guidance and I'm patiently holding still I need the anger and hurt to release because I do believe I will not see or hear the answer amongst my pain so here's okay that's the end of the letter I want to say some things to you about what you wrote in this letter girl you are not tripping okay you are not tripping okay I'm Holy Ghost feel <laughs> love the Lord and you are not tripping um and this is what i'm saying god has given you guidance god is telling you that there should be an end to this and so this is what i think you have to really really define. five years ago five five years, five years is a long time this is what i think this is what i want you to consider you asked your husband when the expiration date is my suggestion is given the expiration date you know because asking is one thing and saying this is how long mm -hmm. i can live in this situation however mm -hmm. if you can you to want them to stay in this position I am not mad at you at all but I will have to get an apartment because I can't continue to live like this this is not what I had in mind for marriage but if we're going to do something new in our marriage the new thing is going to be me getting a separate place perhaps you still love them and want to stay married and all of those things but you need that separation I'm hoping that that will reveal to him how serious this is for you because this is not acceptable to grown folks now listen I don't know at what point in the pandemic this was so i don't know if that but it sounds like they wasn't working before five pandemic. Years, been right been the pandemic years. ain't been but five been months five three months four yeah. months so this is not pandemic related so i no. really would tell your husband you know i don't want to say tell your husband you know but yeah i say tell him 
communicate with him. Make him aware. Make he needs to be made aware of the shift. There is a shift mm-hmm. taking place, and I want you to be aware of the shift. The shift is me. Oh, yeah. I'm shifting. I'm shifting. At first, when this happened, I was all right. I thought it was temporary. As I have shifted, now it's me. It's not you. I'm shifting. Okay, y'all are fine with this. I'm the one shifting. I'm no longer fine with this, and I want to know where you shift into so that we can shift where we shift into when we shift to do what we shift in. You know, and and I'm not saying necessarily, and that's one part of it. The other part of it is him in the bills. You know what could be interesting is maybe just letting the lights be off one day. And, yeah, that's the option too. You know, and him kind of being like, "Well, what happened to the lights?" And you, and like, "Well, what happened to you?" You say chat? it's on your feet. You <laughs> <tell him> it's <laughs> on your feet. <laughs> the li- I went to turn the lights on, the but lights they were on, on your, your feet. feet. The light switch moved to your yeah. feet. You know, because mm-hmm. I can't do all of this by myself. No. Now, not not I can't. I won't. I won't do all of this by myself. Not going while to you and these grown folks sit up, and I'm the only. Uh, no. Now, to be fair, I want to say this as well. Okay, this is probably a broken um, formula somewhere within his family tree. You know what I mean? Because as a woman, I can't imagine sitting at my son's house not working and that just being okay with me. So there is a broken pathology somewhere in the family where taking advantage of people is a symptom of the broken pathology. And so I really do think, you know, and you said you've tried marriage counseling. Maybe you need to do some counseling on your own because you also have to determine within yourself at what point six years in five years into this situation did you change your vision of marriage did you want to just be in this relationship so bad that you were willing to um you know sacrifice on some things that are really important to you how did you come to that place how are you going to get back to that place where you begin to set a standard because at this point we have a standard in place whether you like the standard or don't like the standard we have set a standard that we are okay with this five years of living with us and not contributing to anything says that this is okay yeah so if you're shifting into saying it's not okay anymore then we have to figure out how did I get to a place where I felt like this was okay what was I receiving from this relationship that made me willing to compromise where I am but most importantly what is my truth and can I bring this person into my truth with me but I do think he needs to know how serious it is and I would start that by not asking him their expiration date but rather telling him this is so there is an expiration for this living situation situation and it may not be yes. them moving out it could be me moving out but I can't do it not like this well I, I can actually speak on this even more so because my brother-in-law sister-in-law and mother-in-law lived with my husband and I for a little over a year um and it was exhausting just one year and so to say five years I, I just couldn't even imagine But during that time, same situation, they weren't working um, and and we kind of were taking care of everything. And so what I did was I set them down and we talked about goals. Uh, Like you said, this is a a pathology that could be in the family. And so there's a number of things that could be happening here where they don't really know how to reach for those opportunities or they don't really know how to find those opportunities. And so we sat down and we talked to them about finding jobs, applying for jobs, interviewing, um, how much money we needed every month if they were going to stay. Um, And we also talked about them moving out and, and what that looks like. Because obviously financially for five years, either they haven't been looking for a job haven't felt the need to be looking for a a job or no one has told them to be looking for a job. And so I think before you tell the husband, we need to wrap this thing up and send them on their way, kind of sit down and kind of talk about this pathology um, because you have kids with him, right? Yeah, they have a daughter together and she gained a son. Right. So, so you have kids. And so you want to make sure that this pathology doesn't continue. Um, this, this 
pathology See, of laziness. And that's where Cora and I are different in personalities because to me, when hearing that, after someone who's already stretched, that sounds like signing up to parent them. Because that doesn't sound like a one-time conversation. That sounds like I want to get in. And, and, and that's all right if you feel that. But I'm telling you, my personality type is more like, here are the things that you should keep in mind when moving forward so that you can sustain yourself. But sitting down and walking through this with you sounds like I'm parenting you in some way. And the way that my parents... But in order to change pathology, you have to yeah, be Yeah, me, my to... husband, and my kids can sit, can do this. But we talking about somebody 36 and somebody's mama who's 36. So the 36-year-old, a mother of a 36-year-old, that's a lot. That's a it lot is. to sit down and say, I want to I want to talk to you guys about goals and applying for jobs. But and I'm not saying that. this wrong. I'm just saying my personality type is like, I, this is a one time conversation. I'm not going to be able to walk you through this because you know who can teach you better than I can? Darkness, hunger pains, yeah. no running water. You know, you know what? today what is what, what is which places or something what's going on i don't i don't know but what you i'm saying is, do you know races. you know what taught me how to pay bills when my electricity got cut off that and, is what teaches us all and that's when i said wow if i don't pay these bills they will cut this stuff off yeah you know I I feel like i feel like the conversation i'm talking about like i said it was a year in so for five years somebody's yeah. been silent for five years somebody hasn't been saying anything and your husband feels like you're okay with it now you're about to throw this bomb on him that you're not okay with it and i'm trying to figure out what happened in year one two three and four well, I said Ooh, that. I think she should go them. to some counseling so she could figure that out. But what I'm saying is when you've yeah. had enough, this is what I'm saying is when you get to a point when you've had enough, no longer how much you have suppressed it, when you have had enough, you have had enough. And I don't think I should have to wait another five years to walk you through how I got here to tell you that I'm here. No, 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 no. no. When I say sit down and have a conversation, I'm saying, hey, Y'all need to have a job in six months because yeah, you need to be out. Oh, yeah, that's oh, yeah, that oh, girl, girl, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what, what I'm mean. talking about. So this is this is how you need to apply for jobs, and we need to be able to see you applying for jobs. And this is how much we're going to need during this six month period, every month from you all, uh, before you leave to help us sustain these bills. But that's what I'm saying. This is a conversation that you have when your husband comes and says. Can my mama and son move in here? Mom and brother, but mm -hmm. and brother, can my mama and brother move in here? Then you sit down with your spouse at that point and You're say, right. okay, What's well, what does that look day? like? Yeah. Well, what does that look like? How long are they planning to stay here? Is this a for forever thing, or do we need to get a bigger home? Uh, what what is the plan here? And so it sounds like you all never had a plan. He just kind of let them in. And now they just live in the life like it's golden. And that's not fair. Like y'all need to sit down. He needs to be grown manning this thing and sit down with his mother and brother and say, hey, y'all got six months because you had five years. I listen, I'd probably give them about three months because they've had <laughs> five years. But that, 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 ain't, my that, ain't, right, that ain't my business. <laughs> that's your business. So I would say six months. We need $300 a piece. We're going to give you two weeks to find a job. If you do not find a job in two weeks, you're out. Boom. Okay, next question. I have gone through so much. I lost my stepmother in 2018, and then one month later, I lost my mom to suicide. And then in 2019, lost my little brother to suicide. I'm raising my son without his father. My father isn't much help. I do have a good man and just don't know how to treat him. I respect him, yet I still feel like I'm tripping. I have lied and cheated and manipulated before I committed to him, even though God had already told me he was my husband. 
I knew he was my husband, but didn't understand what it all meant. So I just did what I wanted and he didn't stop me. And I have to deal with the damages I created. He questions everything, even though I am faithful and considerate now. I still manage to fill him with doubt and I'm so consumed by grief and guilt that I get upset. He doubts me when I'm the one who caused it. I'm not being powerful or strong or firm and I just need something, someone to talk some sense into me, to shake me and say, wake up. I know this good man isn't leaving me, but I also don't want to take him for granted. Okay, so I'm really sorry for your losses. That's a lot of grief to deal with in a Mm -hmm. short amount of time. And I can only imagine the pain that you're still in about those losses. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're in a relationship and you're still trying to sort through your own grief and emotions and pain, that just like the saying says, hurt people end up hurting people. I think the greatest gift that you can give this man that you're in a relationship right now is the gift of really understanding who you are, understanding how your grief has affected you, understanding how your pain is affecting you, understanding why you ended up cheating. It's one thing to cheat. It's another thing to really understand why you cheated. What was I looking for? What was I running away from? What did this person make me feel? Even if it was an illusion that I feel so numb to myself, this person and make me feel alive well why aren't you able to feel alive consistently within your world so I really suggest that you should get some counseling I don't even necessarily know that you should get counseling with the spouse or with your boyfriend as much as you need some kind of one-on-one counseling but what I would say to him is I understand the trauma and damage that I have created in this relationship and I want to get to the root of it because not just because you deserve better but because I deserve better I my son deserves better and I want to show up in the world as a better person I haven't been proud of who I am but I feel like there is still an opportunity for me to be transformed and so these are the things that I'm doing to really help me become a healthier version of myself and uh, ask him to give you room to grow and to become healthy and to in exchange I think also ask him what he needs what do you need during this season and to determine whether or not you can do both of those at the same time it may be your husband but it may not be fit for you guys to be together right now maybe he needs a healthier version of who you are um absolutely I agree a hundred percent I think that I would go even further to say to get a psychiatrist Mm. um just because it sounds like there's a history of depression Mm -hmm. uh with the suicides uh on both sides I believe um I heard the mother and her mother Mm -hmm. Yes. And so there's a there's some type of depression going on here in this bloodline that I think needs to be addressed. Um, And you yourself may be going through some depression um, with the grief alone, but just outside of grieving, going through some depression that you may not even be fully aware of. Sometimes we can mistake our, our grief for underlining conditions. Uh, that needs to be looked at. And so a counselor will be able to talk you through it, but a psychiatrist can test you, uh, treat you, and give you medication if need be, um, if you have any type of chronic depression or anything like that. I think it's very important for you to get get into some type of psychotherapy, get to a psychiatrist so that you can figure that out um, within yourself as far as this depression and, and hurt and stuff is concerned. And then the other side is to give yourself permission to grieve. However long that's going to take, however long um, you feel that's going to be, give yourself permission to grieve. This is, is a, a strange thing in a relationship. Uh, it, it, it takes a toll on a relationship and it can be very, very isolating if you're not careful. So try to, to make sure that you give yourself the, the proper time to grieve and to let people know that you are still grieving. There's some confusion. There's some anger. There's some hurt. There's a lot of things going on in you right now that you can't expect to do by yourself on your own with no help. Uh, it, it's not a, a matter of Healing takes time. It's a matter of you needing to get the help that you need right now so that you don't end up um, going down the same hill that your mother and brother 
went down. And I know when we hear words like psychotherapy or psychologist, that sometimes we can think money. <laughs> it's going to cost a lot of money, but don't be afraid to look up resources to do the homework and really mm-hmm. determine how much it is because it could be, you know, eating in for a week instead of eating ordering out may give you what you need in order for you to get the help and resources that you need, but make sure you make this a priority. And so let us know Mm -hmm. where you are on your journey. And thank you for sharing that with us. I know it cost you a lot. Koki Bear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. You got a snack for me? Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. I think that the best snack that I can give and have been giving for uh, the last few weeks to my Destiny World kids is Luke ten nineteen. It's my favorite scripture. Um, and it simply says that the Lord is giving you the authority to tread and trample over scorpions and serpents and to overcome all of the power of the enemy. And nothing, this is my favorite part, nothing by no means shall harm you. And I think what's beautiful about this scripture is that you will find many scriptures in the Bible where God has given us power. And it's not something we had to work for. It's something that he felt like we just had to have. And so I want you to remember that you have power that you didn't have to work for. So you need to be able to put that power into work and push it for yourself. And then I want you to remember that nothing by no means shall harm you. That even though there's a lot going on in the world right now, coronavirus and every other virus and racism virus and just a bunch of stuff going on, nothing by no means shall harm you. You will endure through this. You will make it through this, but you can't do it if you don't use your power. It is not a lack of power given. It is a lack of power use. Oh, my Thank you for sharing that snack and for doing this last minute podcast with me. I felt like we could use a little bit of core in our life. My pleasure. Absolutely. Okay. okay I'm going to pray us out. God, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to still be connected, even when we feel divided and hurting and in pain. Father, it's my prayer that everyone listening to this podcast today would feel your love that they would be filled with your spirit and that they would feel your peace. Father, we need your peace like never before. Peace that we may progress, peace that we may stand in protest, peace that we may stay healthy and well and not allow stress or, or anxiety to stand in our way. Father, when we have your peace, we can stand in the middle of the greatest of storms and still be anchored. And so, Father, we just ask that you would bring us back to center, that we would be anchored, that we would be confident, and that we would trust your word, Father, that we are protected, just as that scripture in Luke 10, Father, that we are protected because we are aligned with everything that you are in this earth, Father. Give us strength to do what we need to do. I'm thinking about my girl who's got to have that tough conversation and everyone else who's got tough conversations to have. Give us the words to say that we may build people up and not hurt them, even when we are challenging them and also God heal every mind that's going through pain and depression and darkness father allow this podcast to serve as a light but may they also reach for that next light until they're out of the tunnel in Jesus name I pray amen amen you want me to give you a joke before we go I guess (laughs) no (laughs) go what (laughs) what what do you call a dog with no legs I no leg dog. What? I don't even know what's happening right now. You can't call him nothing because he ain't going to call. Mm, good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs>